Minneapolis and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I also wanna thank the NWDC organization, which I'm proud and honored to be a part of. Um, so let's get rolling. Well, how did I get here? That's the question, how did I get here? I guess I never really wanted to work. I love to play and playing with clay and sharing what I do with others has been a gift in my life. It wasn't easy, I had to play damn hard to get here, uh, wherever this is. <clears throat> not exactly how I got my start. I started out young, but not this young. I was 16 before I got on the wheel. Um, I had no idea what clay was as a child, but I loved playing in the mud. Uh, fire was also a favorite pastime of mine as a child. No, I didn't burn down the house, but I was on the path in a good talking to by the fire marshal and my father's belt got me straightened out pretty quick. My earliest memories when I wasn't starting fires um, was my time spent on the beach. Huntington, Laguna Beach mostly, playing in the ocean and building sand castles. castles uh, the castles in my head were very different than the ones that I made, but I loved them all just the same. And I mentioned Laguna Beach because we went there often, and every time we'd go, we'd visit the Pottery Shack. My mother would purchase pieces to add to her apple pattern dishes, uh, which I own now and, and use every day. Um, we always went to the beach first, so I'd be worn out and wouldn't run through the place like a five-year-old in a china shop. Uh, this is where I first saw pots being thrown on a potter's wheel. And in my mind, I still see an old woman sitting at a kick wheel turning pots, which kept me entertained while my mom and sisters did their shopping. We moved from Southern California to Tucson, Arizona. And there, you know, it was a beautiful place, not much mud, mostly dirt and sand. <clears throat> In 1964, we moved to Bellevue, Washington, which has a whole new and different environment to discover. There was plenty of clay to be found and I loved uh, carving sculpture in the cliffs and ravines. Obviously, this is not Bellevue, and these are obviously not my sculptures, but I thought it was a great photo, just the same. Um, so where are the pots? I promise they're coming. In 1972, at the age of 16, I met my mentor and lifelong friend, Regnal Reinholstein, who sadly passed away in 2014. Regnor was teaching ceramics at Sammamish, at, teaching ceramics at Sammamish High School. Um, I saw him doing a throwing demonstration and I was completely seduced by the magic of it all. That was it. I knew then that I had to learn this craft. So I dug in deep. Uh, I was hooked and spent most of my time in the pottery. Mm -hmm. Regnor uh, left before my senior year and eventually a new young graduate from the University of Washington replaced him. That was Sam Scott, who was young and eager to share uh, his ceramic uh, knowledge. Before there was running start program, my buddy and I moved to Port Angeles to finish our senior year at Peninsula College. We had uh, a great program there and under Bill Merrill. And I got a good foundation and understanding in glazed materials. Regnor was incredibly generous. He inspired and encouraged me and many others. He introduced his teachers to me, Robert Sperry, Patty Warashina, Howard Kotler, and many other influential art dealers and patrons. Ruth Namora, who sadly passed away in 2020, became the director of the Northwest Craft Center Gal and Gallery in Seattle in 1963, which she ran for over 40 years. Ruth gave me opportunities to show and sell my work, 
promote my work to influential people and collectors from the 70s until she stepped down. Uh, the gallery was forced to close in 2017. I couldn't find an image of Panak Art Gallery in Bellevue and it moved around a bit, but originally it was next door to Uncle Harold's Hobby Shop. That was one of my favorite places as a kid. And uh, if my mom took me to Uncle Harold's, I was also going to Panaka. She knew that I wasn't going to be a, a lawyer or, you know, doctor or anything like that, I think, at an early age. So she tried to push the arts on me a little bit. Panaka was where I had my first gallery show in 1977. I also spent many hours of my childhood each year at the Pacific Northwest Arts and Crafts Fair, um, now known as the Bellevue Art Museum Art Fair. After many failed attempts to participate in the, in the show as an artist, I finally got accepted. And I did that fair for 21 years. I won awards and I was a juror for the 50th annual art fair. This is some work from that show at Panaka, and my lifelong friend, Michael McCullough, who was uh, also a potter, um, he's on the left, I'm on the right. So Carl Krogstead shot that photo and we had quite a day with him. Anybody that knows Carl Krogstead probably has a, a Krogstead story. Mm -hmm. um, so Regnor had a show back in Cleveland in 1977, and what a road trip that was. So we stopped at Ken Ferguson's place for a couple of nights on the way back. We had previously met Ken at a workshop he taught at uh, Pottery Northwest in Seattle, where I'd taken many workshops from notable artists. He showed us his studio, took us to Victor Babu's studio, and showed us around the Kansas City Art Institute where Mike and I ended up um, going to school. So finally some pots. Um, the platter on the left is one of four that I made in 1977 at Courtney Branch's studio where I apprenticed before I went off to the Kansas City. Uh, the work on the right is from the mid eighties and it is a pretty good example of the functional work that I produced over many years. Um, those platters were all 20 inch, but I made most, most of the platters I made or bowls were in 14 inch range. <clears throat> over the years of making, showing and selling functional pots, hopefully they got better over time. That was the intention anyway, right? The market, uh, was changing in the 90s. There were a lot of really good potters and the competition was fierce. So I made a conscious decision to move my work into more of a decorative realm and try to appeal uh, to the new population. Microsoft brought new expansion and new money to the area. People were building huge new houses and I knew that they would need to fill, the, fill those houses with, uh, with artwork. And I wanted my artwork in all those new homes. So there's a whole story behind why I started using gold, but I don't have time to get into that now. Uh, I, it did work out very well for me though, and uh, uh, set me apart from other potters in, in the area. There's a great expansion of volume in both of these inflated forms. And that's exaggerated by the narrow foot that supports them. On the right, the gold band shows constraint and gives a sense that the work is still soft and pliable. It also distinctly separates the shoulder from the body. <clears throat> this became a signature form of mine. And my use of gold Luster started out as simple bands on the rims of pots and then progressively became more and more until I got fully, in. I went all in. So like this golden apple, this was uh, the original 
one from a show at the Northwest Craft Center, and it's about 18 inches across. I had done uh, several others, mostly smaller versions. <clears throat> I like working big, but big is a relative term. Uh, this stoneware jar with porcelain texture, black stain, and my running man motif with gold luster is about 28 inches tall. And the vessel on, on the right has a knockdown texture with copper luster, which gives it sort of a rubbed copper penny effect. And that's about 19, 20 inches across. This full vase is a favorite of mine and has a crackle effect um, with gold luster over black luster. The vase on the right with the platinum has an undulating rim that lends a softer, more fluid quality to the work. The rim treatment picks up uh, accents, picks up or, or accents the line quality, separating the shoulder from the body. The tightness of my work, which I'd always strive for, was beginning to loosen up here. Okay, well then, you know, back to tight again. <laughs> I jump back and forth quite a bit. I love making teapots, but they can be challenging in multiple ways. And little shout out here to uh, Tom Holt, who photographed most of my work up until things went digital. Back to marketing. One of our founders for the NWDC and a dear friend, Bob Sperry, had told me one day that if you hang something on the wall, it changes people's perception. It's no longer seen as a platter to serve food, but becomes a, a piece of artwork to contemplate. So these are examples of uh, fertility plates that, uh, that were uh, very popular for me. This moon platter has a uh, surface texture that would not serve well um, for serving food. So it really belongs on the wall. It also has an optical effect that you can't capture in a photograph. When you view this from one side, it's dark. And as you move to the other side, it becomes lighter progressively. And it's really a wonderful effect. <clears throat> I never gave up on functional pots. I have a love for all kinds of ceramics and that's a love that will never fade. Both of these teapots have gestural qualities. They're functional and visually well-balanced. There's no brushwork, texture, layered glaze or luster enhancements to distract the viewer's eye. So the form must be strong and the added components must also be in proportion in order to complete these pieces successfully. I've done a lot of Raku, mostly teaching it, but I was never comfortable firing my functional forms that way. Uh, it's a great firing technique for sculpture though. So on the left here, left to right, seeker of wisdom and truth, rites of passage and rites of passage father to son. These uh, were part of a series of altars that I had made 25 years ago. And I guess I was doing a lot of soul searching at 40. <clears throat> this is a thrown and altered form on the left. I never really did much figurative work, but there's, there's one. <laughs> um, the heart is a fragile thing is in the center there and that's a container. And actually that's on the mantle behind me. Um, and uh, urchit times, urchit measures on the right where I'm beginning to combine uh, my ceramic work with, with stone. On the left and center are both sides of one sculpture and that sculpture is titled Shape of War and Peace. And on the right is the salmon's nest. Um, each of these have a, a bit of mixed media 
so stone, fiber, metal, ceramic, wax, uh, shoe polish. There's, there's a few other things in there too, probably. <clears throat> These are other sculptures with the same basic form as that uh, shape of war and peace. And these are fired in uh, foil sector technique. These lidded jars are also um, foil sagger, and it's a it's a really wonderful process, but one that I have done a fair amount of. In 2012, I was hired by the founder of DigiPen Institute of Technology. Claude Comer to design and build out a studio, create a curriculum and teach classes. I'm still there and I just love it. I absolutely love it. This is an installation I made at DigiPen upon my return from cancer treatments. Um, honestly, I don't know how I pulled this off. I had never done anything like this and I was pretty messed up physically cognitively and emotionally. I can't think of a better way to reintegrate back into the workplace than working with Clay. It was a magically healing experience. And I did this in two weeks, um, built and fired. It wasn't installed at that point. It was done pretty quickly. One, uh, one, one of, this is one of the few pieces that I made in my own stu studio since I started working at DigiPen. This is titled Alien Artifact, uh, and it's another mixed media piece and light sculpture. There's some deep personal content here in this piece, but it's still looking for a home, just, just saying. These are more calming, pleasant luminaries. Um, Hand-built electric lamp on the left and wheel thrown porcelain on the right. The gold foil on the bottom was used rather than gold luster um, that you've seen in most of the other work that I've shown you. I did a series of musical icons. Um, these were low fire earthenware initially hand cut stencils fixed to a plate and sandblasted. I was trying to get these done for a show at the Northwest Craft Center, but my hands were killing me from cutting these things out with an X-Acto knife. I was complaining about it to a friend, fellow potter, and also a Northwest Designer Craftsman member, Lauren Lukens. Um, when he looked at me and he said, you know, you could have those done at a print shop. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, um, it's good to have smart friends. Instantly, I was able to get way more detail with the laser cuts. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good thing, but um, it's still a very time consuming process. But I really love Jimi Hendrix. I love the way he came out. And uh, Bob Marley is also one with a lot of detail. <clears throat> um, I did three Marilyn Monroe plates, black and white, white on white, and this red one was requested by my daughter. And these are these were hand cut. That was some of uh, the original, that and the linen pieces. I had to do the cake, Elvis, and he had to be on gold. So uh, this gold on porcelain and also hand cut. The curator from Safeco Insurance Company saw a platter like this in a show at the Northwest Craft Center and offered me a commission for their corporate art collection. It was a simple commission, 13 20 inch plates, gold center, black rim, but as most of you know, a commission is an open invitation for disaster. My 20 inch torn edge platters never cracked until I took that commission. I made over 50 platters to fill that order. I was plagued with cracking at all stages of the process and it was killing me. 
I tried everything to make it stop. Uh, finally, I called Bob Sperry for help. And he simply said, Ken, make the cracks work for you. Wow, <laughs> what a revelation. It was like he was giving me permission to be an artist. Uh, I had to stop thinking like a potter and put on my artist hat. Well, I got the 13 platters done, and then I had a slew of blank canvases to play on. So that's exactly what I did. I ended up with some real beauties too. Uh, that was a really great experience for me. When the curator from Safeco saw the variety of work I'd done, she selected a very different grouping than that original order. So if you look at the rim on this one, you'll notice that the torn edge is not ragged. Uh, I began compressing the edges with uh, plastic and it changed the look that I initially was going for, but I had much less cracking. And uh, honestly, I prefer less cracking. I'll take the cracks if they come, but I'm not, uh, I'm not promoting at this point. Um, so those were a few of the plates or platters that I did for that series, but only, uh, only a couple of those went into the Safeco collection. Um, these next platters came later when I started making the centers smaller and the rims wider to accommodate glazed trailing decoration, um, adding a textural element and taking advantage of the luster's ability to reflect the surface that it's applied to, um, whether gloss or matte. The center of this piece is an impressed design done with a small tool called a dragon scaler. The rim is a platinum luster over textured fake ash. A dear friend of mine, um, a painter, passed away in 2019. I was teaching him ceramics, but I think he was teaching me much more. His spirit inspired me to make these plates and to take chances, be fearless. Uh, so that's what I've tried to do. And again, uh, I'm inspired by the late, great Robert Sperry. The piece on the left I did for Northwest Designer Craftsman exhibition. And like other works, or this and other works led to the piece on the right, which led to the development of these pieces. Um, this work is unquestionably influenced by Sperry's work, but I'm very comfortable with that. I loved Bob and I loved his work. I, I, you know, to this day, I love his work. I can't help be in, but be influenced by it. I, I have a few pieces around here I look at all the time. They're my favorite, favorite things, uh, favorite pots. So yeah, I, I make no bones about it. Um, I've been working with this form for about six years now. When I look back um, at this work, you know, I, I see it that it kind of relates to work that I was doing in the 90s, <clears throat> like this jar here. Um, the crawling was unintentional, but I took advantage of the defect. And what a blessing that was. I love this piece. I, I wish I owned it. I, I wish I knew where it was, at least. So a friend asked me one day, if I was afraid of color. And my response was a defensive no. But I felt like it was a challenge. So I introduced color into the black and white series of work that I'd been 
uh, that I'd been doing. And I transitioned quite successfully, I think. I do like a challenge. This is the same piece shot from different angles, um, showing both black and white and color, as well as controlled form and dramatically altered. I think this piece displays um, where I've been and where I'm going with my work. This is called trauma. I love using this form and applying different surface techniques to achieve something different, a, a different look. Um, these are all low fire alternative firing techniques, electric oxidation, gas reduction, foil sagger, pit firing, um, luster, overglaze, you name it, and combinations of the aforementioned. I made these in preparation of a presentation. I gave it in Sika in 2019. How low can you go? This was my attempt to imitate my own work at uh, firing at low temperatures that I had been producing. Um, at porcelain and stoneware temperatures for years. I went to China a couple of times. Thank you to my dear friend and fellow member of NWDC, Cheryl Lea Gwen, who facilitated this for me. I led a group in 2005, and I went along with the Archie Bray group in 2010. We exchanged with our Chinese counterparts in many ways. Um, I was fascinated with the Xing teapots before I went there, but I was absolutely consumed with them after visiting the Xing, meeting some of the masters and working alongside some of the factory workers who are phenomenal craftsmen. China is amazing. The country is so steeped in, in craft. It's driven their economy for centuries. And, I learned so much while I was there. If you get the opportunity to go to China, I highly recommend. Very interesting. Uh, the, these are teapots that I've made um, that were inspired by those lovely Yixing teapots. If you drink tea or anything for that matter, you need a cup. So <laughs> here we have cups. Um, I was asked by the NWDC to make a presentation gift for Lloyd Herman. And after many attempts, I finally got one I was comfortable gifting to our living treasure, Lloyd. <clears throat> so I've made a lot of cups, but for years I didn't make any. Um, they take a lot of time and, and are generally undervalued. Most Potters have a signature cup or a mug, but I get bored making the same thing over and over. So I like to mix things up, um, try new things. I, I think this is how we uh, discover new things and grow as artists. These are hand-built, fairly recent cups. So I'm always conflicted about the work that I'm comfortable making, which was tight craftsmanship and the work that I've always admired and, and wanted to make, but never felt secure about. Well, I'm out of the closet now. <laughs> it's taken a lot of work and a lot of time, but um, I, I'm happy that I'm able to uh, uh, do some of, the, some of the work that I've always wanted to do. I made this piece at Bellevue College. This might have been the beginning of that. Um, I taught there uh, at, in their continuing education program for a few years. <clears throat> uh, yeah. this, this piece was inspired by a visit that I had with Chuck Hines. We did a, a trade and I came home with a nice tea bowl. I didn't see him work, but I saw his tools, which were just a few sticks and a knife. 
I mean, I love the texture uh, that he achieved and the simplicity of the forming method. So I thought I'd give it a go. And I found great pleasure in, uh, in the process. And to this day, one of my favorite cups to drink from. I broke it, but I've mended it and still use it. On the left is an extruded vessel, textured and altered. And on the right, slab built vessels. Um, that was 2017. This work is fairly recent, it's, you know, within the last three or four years, and maybe, maybe more recent than that. I don't know, but I think you can probably see a change uh, occur <laughs> in the way I'm approaching clay. These are from the, uh, uh, a series called Architectural Decay. And those are maybe 10 inches or so. Um, I, I like working bigger. And these are, these pieces are quite a bit bigger now. I hadn't thrown for over a year for health reasons. Um, when I was asked to make some urns for a friend, I kind of jumped back in it. The jar on the right was purchased by John Bard <clears throat> to add to his amazing collection of American studio ceramic pottery. He now has over a thousand works that are a future bequest to the New Orleans Museum of Art and LSU Museum of Art. The one on the right was part of the original commission that inspired these pieces and that piece was sent to Japan. These are smaller works that I was able to do for my online class that I taught during the COVID pandemic, which we are still dealing with, sadly. Um, at the time, <clears throat> two to three pounds was about all I could handle. I was having a pretty rough time, but, but I made all the classes and got through them. Um, this, this one's a little bit bigger, but not much. This one's maybe eight or nine inches. I really do prefer working larger when I physically can. And I pushed myself to make these pieces on a good day. Uh, they're very thick and heavy. These, these are about 17 inches tall. This is new work. Um, these hand-built forms came about following a demonstration that I did during, during my online class. Um, and these are the first ever soda fired pots. I'm really excited about them. I owe a big thank you to Miles Strusnitz for inviting me to fire in his kiln and to Rita Zaki for inviting me to slip coat my work in his studio prior to loading. Um, and also to Reed Ozaki for working his ass off to produce a really beautiful firing. I couldn't be there to unload. So Reed took uh, photographs of these pieces at the kiln site. This is his current work I pulled out at the kiln on Friday. I want to invite everyone to come to Lauren Lucan's uh, Brace Point Pottery and Gallery in West Seattle during the West Side Artist Tour in two weeks. That's September 25th and 6th. Um, it'll be mostly outdoor events, so come by and see what's new. Say hello. I want to thank everyone who made it to the end of this presentation with me. I'm not waving goodbye. Please stick around for a few minutes uh, of question and answers. Uh, hopefully we still have time. I haven't run over too much. I'm going to turn it back over to Lois Harbaugh now. So thanks again and take it away, Lois.